These people are part of a global study. We're about to investigate the urban myth, six degrees of separation. The idea that in a world of more than six billion people, everyone is connected in just a few steps. That's to say that you know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows me or anyone else on the planet. When scientists began exploring six degrees, they made some profound discoveries. Nature has a hidden blueprint, a structure that connects us all. The world is more highly, more globally, and more unexpectedly connected than we ever thought. Testing an urban myth has led to an entirely new branch of science, network theory, and some believe it will change our lives. Networks are important because if we don't understand networks, we can't understand how markets function, how organizations solve problems, or how societies change. Six Degrees has the potential to change the way we fight terrorism, predict pandemics, and combat disease. It may prove to be one of the greatest scientific insights of recent times. And for that, there's one person to thank. Hollywood actor Kevin Bacon. Mark Vidal is a geneticist at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. He's the target of our study to test six degrees of separation. The claim that everyone on the planet can be connected to everyone else in just a few steps. Is it real? or just an urban myth. We'll find out. Bei über 6,8 Milliarden Menschen auf der Welt wird es denke ich mal ganz schön schwierig, die richtige Person ausfindig zu machen. We've chosen 40 people from around the world to see if they can get a package to Vidal. Our participants have never met him and they aren't allowed to look him up on the internet. The rules are simple. They must try and get the packages to Boston by passing it to family or friends, people they know on a first-name basis. I have difficulty believing that they're going to be successful in delivering that package. Will any of the packages make it to Boston? And how many steps will it take? Eight? Eight steps, maybe? One of our starters is college student Jessica Otto. She lives in the German town of Willich, near Dusseldorf. I've sent the package to Kat. I thought because her boyfriend, he studied in Boston and he has to do something with physics. And I thought he would know a lot of professors and I'm pretty sure that one of those knows Mark Vidal. Hello. Guten Tag, Frau Otto. Testing six degrees of separation is not a trivial matter. A decade ago, the idea began intriguing a small group of researchers trying to explain the world using mathematics. It would eventually lead to the new science of networks. One of the founders of the theory is mathematician Steve Strogartz. His path to discovery began with a broken love affair. Romeo's love increases the more Juliet is currently loving him. So our dot the, a. the more that Romeo currently loves her, the more that she recoils and wants to run away and hide. <laughs> the equation looks like this. I, I had a tumultuous relationship. It was the first relationship of my life with a, a girl in college, and I couldn't understand what she was doing to me. And uh, whenever I seemed to get closer to her and try to, to show her how much I loved her, she would back away. And then when I realized I better give up, this isn't going anywhere, then she was strangely attracted to me. And this push and pull felt to me, and probably this is why I had so much trouble with her, it felt to me like a mathematical equation. 
And so I started to write equations for this give and, and take or push and pull between two people, equations for the growth or decay of their love as a function of time. This to me is a beautiful thing. The unity of nature, that's something you can learn in physics, has the same mathematical description as the, the oscillations of a love affair, the ups and downs of a, of a romantic relationship. The same formulas. Having explained romance with equations, Strogartz turned his attention to other mysteries. Nothing had perplexed him more than the phenomenon known as synchronicity. How can a population of dissimilar individuals suddenly synchronize? How do fireflies flash in unison across great distances, or crickets chirp as one? How does order emerge from chaos? We're so used to thinking that if there's a group following, acting in concert, it's because there's a conductor for the orchestra. But that's not necessarily so. There's a hundred billion brain cells acting like a, the most complicated thing in the universe, and there's no cell that is the master conductor of the brain. The brain does it as a group. The heart has 10,000 pacemaker cells that tell the rest of the heart when to beat. Who's in charge? Who's the pacemaker for the pacemaker? Nobody. Strogartz was not alone in his passion for the simple elegance of numbers. Duncan Watts also wanted to make sense of the world with maths. Here we are, sort of just kind of shambling through uh, life, trying to make sure the wheels don't come off, but nothing like science. And I started to think, this is what I should be devoting my life to, to try and bring something like science to this, this real world. Watts had abandoned a promising career as Australia's top naval graduate to study physics. And when he arrived at Cornell University, Professor Strogatz knew this was no ordinary student. When I walked by his office, I saw a picture of him hanging by his fingertips from uh, a sheer cliff in Australia. And I thought, that's the kind of person that I could see myself working with on a, a difficult problem. Strogatz had found a worthy collaborator with whom he could attempt to tackle some of the deepest mysteries of nature. We would try to do something intellectually dangerous, to go to some place at the edge, some place that, um, that people hadn't really thought about before, possibly even a question that doesn't seem like uh, a question you're allowed to think about. I like those problems that are, that are almost taboo, because that's where there's a lot to be discovered. Watts and Strogartz began to investigate the mystery of synchronicity. And for that, they needed a real-world example to study. It occurred to us that actually here in Ithaca we have the world champion of synchronization called snowy tree crickets. On a warm summer evening, thousands of them will all start chirping in unison. If we could capture some of these crickets, could we predict from an individual's behavior, how an enormous population of hundreds or thousands of crickets would behave as a group. So we would find a tree and then I would clamber up in the tree with a flashlight on my head and a little glass vial and try and find these critters. Well, the hope was that each individual cricket was actually obeying little mathematical rules, unconsciously, that, that each cricket when responding to the chirp of another cricket, just shifts its rhythm by a certain amount that was very reproducible. I'd sit there for, you know, three hours, waiting for the damn crickets to chirp, and they wouldn't chirp. Testing individual crickets would never work. The answer seemed to lie elsewhere in their interaction as a group. You have you know, hundreds of these crickets and they're all sort of interacting with each other in some kind of complicated way. And 
the question that came up in my mind over and over again was, you know, who is listening to whom? And so that got him thinking more generally about patterns of connections, about networks. And it was around that time that something his father said came into his mind. Do you know that you're only six handshakes from any person on earth? And I started to think maybe it's true that, the, that this six degrees of separation phenomenon applies in the real world. And what are the consequences, if that's true, for the synchronization of crickets, for the, the way that, that disease spreads throughout uh, a human population? And it was almost a scary thought because we could see when he, when he suggested it to me that, that we were on the brink, if we could do anything sensible, of a whole new science that didn't exist yet. Almost by accident, they stumbled across a huge gap in our knowledge. Remarkably, no one had paid much attention to networks before. It was at that you know, pivotal moment, I really sort of forgot about the crickets and started to think about networks. In our study to test the idea, the packages are sent from locations all over the world. Each participant needs to try and get it to Professor Mark Vidal in Boston. In Paris, dancer Nadia Tomasova believes her letter has a good chance of making it. I think somebody could send this to me because maybe as I traveled around the world, it makes me very connected around the world, yeah. I'm sending it to my friend in Boston, to uh, Josephine Pra. She's a ballet dancer. I hope she will get it. Nadia is part of an international network of dancers. To her, the big world appears small. Is six degrees as simple as that? Mathematically, it's pretty easy to make small worlds. If I know 100 people, and each of them knows 100 people, then already, within two steps of me, two degrees of separation, there's 100 times 100. And so if I do another step, so now three degrees, that's a million people, and keep playing like that, and you'll see that within five steps, you've got more people than there are on the whole Earth. But there's something terribly wrong with that calculation. It may be true that I know 100 people and each of them knows 100, but a lot of those are the same people, right? It's not 100 new people each time. There's a lot of overlap in our social circles. And so this is what makes the problem very difficult. In a Kenyan village, one of our participants is struggling with this problem. <laughs> Okay. Nia Loka knows everyone in her village of Nimware, but nobody seems to know anyone who can get the package closer to Boston. In Nimware, the world seems very large. But it's not a problem restricted to Kenyan villagers. No matter where we live or what we do, we all tend to know people very much like ourselves. We're clustered into closed circles, locked within our own social networks. This is the paradox at the heart of the small world problem, that the, the world is simultaneously very small, with everyone only a few steps from everyone else, and yet very clustered. There seemed to be a contradiction. How could the world be both small and large at the same time? Solving this paradox was the key to understanding Six Degrees. And so we just started to play around. It 
was pure mathematics, fun and games, where a network is thought of as points connected by lines. And then asking whether they would have the property of being a small world, meaning that everyone is only a few uh, hops away from everyone else in the network. Watts began with a thought game, a mathematical model. Imagine uh, we, we have a crowd in a soccer stadium. And now imagine that you're trying to do the experiment of getting a message from this part of the stadium to the farthest remote part of the stadium. And the only way that we can get a message is to talk to the person next to us. Right? And then that person has to talk to the person next to them. It's going to take a very long time for the message to get from there to there. Now if I give the person on the other side of the, uh, uh, the soccer stadium a, a walkie-talkie and I have the other one, we can communicate immediately. Clearly, our path length has shrunk because now the person next to me can communicate with the person on the other side of the stadium simply by asking me to put a call. All of a sudden, a whole group of people in my local neighborhood can connect to a whole group of people on the other side of the stadium in many, many fewer steps than they could before this one link came into existence. Just a single random link has an enormous effect. And add just a few more links, and distance in the stadium has all but disappeared. The world doesn't gradually get smaller. It drops off a cliff. Here was a model that could make a big world small. In the Kenyan village of Nimware, Neoloka's package has been going nowhere. But as Watts and Strogarts predict, just a single link can make a big difference. Hey. Hey. <laughs> 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 Nialoka's aunt Margaret has come from Nairobi for a visit. She's the link to the outside world. Back to meet Margaret. Welcome. Come in. I've come to pick your package. Thank you. I don't know anybody in Boston. I don't even know this Mark Vidal. But I know somebody in New York. I know a lady called Didi Halleck. Hello, ma'am. It's Express Package from Kenya. From Kenya? Oh, it must be Margaret. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, ma'am. Oh, I'll have to open it. I was in Kenya uh, last summer working with Margaret Owino. I don't know any scientists in Boston, but I do know Linen Mo, who lives in Cambridge. And she's an old friend, and I thought, her husband's some kind of scientist. I thought maybe if I send it to Li Min, she could, she would also be able to somehow connect. A key part of the six degrees effect is that all of us know someone who has moved away and has now forged a link between us and, and geographically distant communities. That random connection is bringing the whole world together and it's happening all across the world with everybody. Nice okay. Have a nice day. Uh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Watson Strogarts had a theory, but now they needed to prove it by studying real networks. The problem was, no one had thought it worth mapping any, except one. For the scientists, it was Hollywood that offered the first possibility to put their ideas to the test. More than a million actors have worked in Hollywood on half a million films. Here was a huge network of connections. In the mid-90s, some college students devised a trivia game based around the idea of linking every actor to just one star, Kevin Bacon. 
Rodney Dangerfield was in Caddyshack with Bill Murray, and Bill Murray was in She's Having a Baby with Kevin Bacon. Then computer student Brett Chayden thought it would be fun to turn the Kevin Bacon game into a website. Welcome to the Oracle of Bacon at Virginia website. I wrote a program that would extract the path uh, from every actor or actress to Kevin Bacon. Before I knew it, uh, a lot of people were visiting and a couple of the uh, websites picked up on it and made it their pick of the week or whatever and that brought in a tremendous number of visitors. Abbott and Costello. Brett Chayden helped turn Kevin Bacon into a cult figure and the inspiration for a major scientific breakthrough. People kept saying to us when we would talk about Six Degrees that, oh yeah, that's the Six Degrees of Pe Kevin Bacon game that everyone was playing at that time. But we thought, well, actually, it's a scientifically serious thing. So we wrote to, to Brett and said, look, you know, we're doing research on networks and, and, you know, we think that you have this really interesting data and would you mind if we had it? To their astonishment, the Hollywood network conformed precisely to the theory. A few random links shrunk the distance between a million actors. The model worked almost perfectly. That There was an incredibly high level of clustering. But it was also the case that everyone could reach everyone uh, through just a few steps. Hey, I am the center of the universe. Kevin Bacon, great as an actor as he is, was not that special in the role that he played in the network. That is, if you looked at any two actors, the typical number of steps between them, people you've never heard of, was about somewhere between three and four. Hey, can I write a check for this? I just need to see some ID. Hold that thought. You're just, hi. Come on. Okay, so I was in a movie with an extra, Eunice, whose hairdresser, Wayne, attended Sunday school with father. Without even knowing it, Kevin Bacon had inspired the first real evidence that small worlds existed. So you see, we're practically brothers. And when the two scientists began looking, small worlds began turning up everywhere. Tests have proven the great power system ready for transmission. America's massive power grid was one network they could test. It's been described as the world's largest machine. So it was a kind of a, an organism that grew itself. The grid is the result of thousands of random events, as new generators and cables were added to meet the growing demands of America's industry and population. We found that it too was a small world, that even though it had 5,000 power plants over half a continent of area, it only took a very few hops to get from any one to any other. We thought, OK, you know, let's be ambitious here. Let's think about you know, completely different kinds of networks. So not networks that are social networks, not networks that involve people at all, something that comes from biology, something that's totally different. There's a certain worm called C. elegans. They've mapped every cell and they know how every cell in its nervous system is connected. We were able to get a hold of the data and when we analyzed that, it too was a small world. We found the same kind of result, short path lengths, high clustering. It was like time to uncork the champagne for both of us. It was very, very thrilling. Their discovery seemed to solve the small world mystery. But as it turned out, it was just the beginning. Tokyo photographer Kenji Maeji is the second link in a chain. He's received a package from Australia, and paradoxically, he plans to send it back in order to get it closer to Boston. I don't think it would be easy, but I decided to send it to my eldest brother. Uh, his name is Nobuyoshi. He lives in Brisbane. Uh, he's a scientist, uh, so I figured he'd know a lot more scientific people than I would and he's got a lot of contacts in the United States as well. Hey, good to see you. 
most of our packages are on their way. In Germany, Jessica is following the progress of her package online. It's made it to Toronto. In Paris, the dancer Nadia is on vacation, and her friend has found the package has come back from Boston, unopened. This is Nadia's letter. It gets returned, so I guess it didn't make it. From 40 original starting points, 27 packages are still on their way, even crossing paths as they pass through the giant sorting hubs of the courier companies. And it's the significance of hubs that would be the next big discovery in network theory. While Strogartz and Watts were pioneering small worlds, another scientist would look at the problem from a different angle. For Hungarian physicist Laszlo Barabashi, understanding networks held the promise of predicting the future. His inspiration came from a classic work of science fiction, Isaac Asimov's Foundation. I have said the empire will lie in ruins within the next century. Asimov's Foundation centers on a mathematician with the power of prediction. But Barabashi had identified a flaw in the story. I started thinking, what is that I could do to predict the future? I realized that what is missing from Asimov's thinking is the network, the structure and the behavior of the network. Because events are never isolated. They depend on each other. They interact with each other. So we need to understand how they interact. To understand these interactions, Barabashi needed a network that had been thoroughly mapped. The major problem was that the data was incredibly difficult to find. But then everything changed. It was the early 90s, and the World Wide Web was exploding in popularity. Here was a huge network he could map by tracing the links between web pages. No one directed the growth of the web. Anyone could put up a site and link to wherever they liked. So the expectation was that the structure would be entirely random. If the World Wide Web to be a random network, then the distribution of the links follows a bell curve. I would find something similar to this. In a bell curve, there are few extremes. Most web pages would be grouped in the middle, having the same number of links. But what he discovered was different. The web links were not evenly spread. Most pages had very few links, but there were some with a huge number of connections. We found a few web pages that had thousands of links pointing to them. And these were the hubs. It was completely new, completely unexpected. First, we did not know what to do with that. This was no random world. It seemed to have an organizing principle based around hubs. In these early days of the web, long before the familiar super sites of today had emerged, Barabashi's study had glimpsed the future. It predicted the potential for the existence of huge hubs, like Amazon and Google and Yahoo turn out to be. Barabashi's hunch was that behind this pattern, there may be a deeper truth lurking. By coincidence, Watts had just published his paper on the small world of Hollywood actors. Barabashi wondered if there could be hubs there too. I got an email from Laszlo Barabasi and he said, would I mind sharing some of the, the data? So we took the data set and we interpreted it just like the World Wide Web as a map. And we asked the question, how many links each actor has? We saw exactly the same pattern as we observed earlier on the World Wide Web. There were many, many actors that had only a few links to other actors. There were a few major hubs, however. Though it was right in front of them, Watts and Strogartz had missed a second great discovery. The funny thing is, we didn't really look. 
And so we had all this, this data looking, you know, staring us uh, in the face, and I never thought to actually plot the distribution. Finding hubs in Hollywood was a major breakthrough. It suggested that networks didn't just grow accidentally. They evolved according to some pattern. And if so, hubs should be everywhere. And sure enough, Barabashi found hub networks in transportation routes, in computer chips, and within the human cell. I kept thinking, how is it possible? Because they cannot be more different in the scope, in the mate, and their nature. More I thought about it, more I realized that there must be a simple explanation for that. Because these are such a different systems that the only way they could be similar to each other is that there is one simple law that describes the structure of all of them. And he discovered that simple equation that describes our complex interconnected world. PK equal K to the minus gamma. That is the formula. Barabashi's equation not only showed that hubs were inevitable, it can also predict the number of hubs in any given network. Here was the secret behind almost every network, the structure that nature uses to spin its webs. And once it could be seen, it revealed networks have peculiar strengths and weaknesses with implications for all of us. There are hundreds and thousands and potentially millions of errors in my cell, and yet I don't even notice. The internet can work even when hundreds of its routers are not functional. If you remove the small nodes, it does not matter. The network will shrink, but will not fall apart. But there is a price you pay for this extreme robustness. If you remove the hubs, the system will fall apart. Society has its hubs too. People who are much more connected than the rest of us. German lawyer Philip Thomas is one of them. And it's made him the obvious target for someone sending a package from Burma. Well, the one who sent the package to me is uh, Michael Newent, an old friend uh, from Burma. He's actually Australian Burmese. Burma is a fairly isolated place, so uh, Burmese, unfortunately, don't have too many contacts with the outside world. Michael knows that um, I have uh, family spread in the US. So um, it must have been pretty obvious for Michael that I might be one potential link in that chain. Does he in this episode? Mama again, does he? Does he? Does he? We live in a connected world. Networks dominate our economy, our environment, and our society. Our health depends on them and yet we barely notice their presence. Through random links or hubs, the world is made small, allowing everything to travel far and fast on the network. This can be good news or totally devastating. It depends on what's spreading on the network. In 2000, a virus, the I Love You bug, took just hours to spread through the world's computer networks. And penetrated the CIA, the Pentagon, and the Houses of Parliament. One of the scientists tracking the virus was physicist Alessandro Vespignani. He was puzzled by its rapid spread and by its resilience. Even though software to kill the bug was released within a day, it survived for months. Japan came back from a week-long holiday to find a love bug still lurking in many people's computers. The quicker is the disease at the beginning, the quicker it should die out from the system. And actually, this was not the case. We were really puzzled by this fact that the high love you virus was lingering in the wild. Like many scientists, Vespignani assumed that viruses spread at random. 
we were, you know, trying a few things and actually something at certain point I was struck by a paper. It was Barabashi's study showing the internet had a predictable structure. When I saw that image of the internet, I thought that that was the pattern that I had to include in the model in order to get a realistic description of what was happening with computer viruses. A virus used network structure to spread unstoppably through the hubs and hide in the far reaches on the net. And as Vespignani learned, this had alarming implications far beyond the internet. I got a question. These results would apply to human sexually transmitted diseases. Well, no way. It was clearly not applicable in my mind because the internet is different from the web of sexual relation. I was wrong. Wilt Chamberlain, nearly seven feet tall even then. Champion basketballer Wilt Chamberlain claimed he'd had sex with 20,000 women, an average of 1.9 couplings per day over his adult life. Wilt was almost unstoppable. Even allowing for some exaggeration, he was clearly a hub in the human sexual network. There are few records left for Wilt to tilt. A Swedish study of sexual behavior showed most people had only a few partners, but a handful had hundreds. The web of sexual relations looked exactly like the internet. It was dominated by a few hubs. And just like I love you, this meant that if a virus entered the network, it would be almost impossible to remove. So suddenly, from one day to another, what we were doing in the computer virus area was important for human diseases. Vespignani's research helps us to understand the resilience of HIV. Despite two decades and billions of dollars in prevention programs, the virus is entering an explosive new era of growth. His findings also help explain the failure of early awareness campaigns to prevent the spread of the disease. These were aimed at the general public long before the significance of hubs were recognized. Vespignani's group is now modeling the intersection of global transport networks and disease. They can predict the spread of a new flu virus. Airline networks are dominated by a few major airports. Once an infected person passes through one of these hubs, the virus will be unstoppable. But Vespignani's research also offers a solution. To avoid a global catastrophe, he believes nations must share their stocks of precious antivirals. What you find is that it's beneficial to the entire world and to each country to share antivirals, to be cooperative and not to be selfish. We form a global network and whatever we do is going to reverberate across the network and have important implication at the, uh, at the global level. The first of our packages has made it to Boston, reaching a colleague of the target, Mark Vidal. Let me run inside and get that package for you, Richard. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sure to deliver it. All right, great. Thank great. you. Great. Great. See you next time. Mark and I serve on some committees together, and I've advised him on a couple of uh, legal matters over the years. He's in the building right next door to me, and I can deliver this package to him quite easily. Okay. Um, would you see that Mark get this envelope, please? Sure. Okay, thank you thank very much. You. So long, thanks. Bye. Mark Vidal is a geneticist. For him, the six degrees study is part of a much greater project to understand the origins of disease. To do so, he's creating the first roadmap of the human cell. Imagine if we try to understand traffic in a city without having any maps, without having any idea 
of how interconnected the different worlds are. Analogies are never perfect, but it's one way that I can imagine how things occur in the cell. Cells are the building blocks of life and hold the genes that determine our development. Those genetic instructions are carried out by thousands of different proteins. The proteins are the little tools, the parts of the cell. They don't work in isolation. They interact with each other. In Vidal's bustling cellular city, proteins are like people, constantly on the move and communicating with one another. If I start from my favorite protein and I ask, what does it interact with? I'm now back to basically a problem of six degrees of separation. Who is connected to whom? Vidal believes that if he could produce a map, then potentially he could locate breakdowns in the system that cause disease, diseases like cancer. I devoted my life to, to trying to understand the interconnectivity between genes. The vast majority of biologists would have thought that even if we had a good quality map of the wiring diagram of the cell, not much really interesting would emerge out of it. Vidal's theory may have come to nothing had there not been another fortunate coincidence. He stumbled upon the work of another scientist, Barabashi's paper describing a universal law in networks. And this really was an eye-opener. What became immediately obvious to me when I opened that magazine, it would be incredible if we could actually use it in the context of cellular networks and try to use similar models to explain human disease. Seeing disease as a network means it's no longer just about biology. It's become a maths problem. And this offers entirely new ways of dealing with disease that are so promising. Laszlo Barabashi has joined forces with Vidal to explore the potential. One day, Laszlo came to my office all excited, saying, what if we looked at all the connections at the same time for all diseases and all genes involved in diseases? The result is the most remarkable network map of all. It shows connections between every known human disease. And just as the Hollywood Actors Network linked stars through their films, we can now see how diseases are linked by the genes they have in common. The network that came out of this analysis had absolutely incredible properties. For one thing, it made diseases we still don't know all the genes that are involved in those diseases. Breast cancer is one example of that. We only know of four genes which cause the disease. And these make up just 10% of all cases of breast cancer. When we have a map like this one, it seems to make a lot of sense to go for the neighbors of the known characters in the story. If we didn't have a map like this, we would go blindly, basically. We would have no way to guide the new research to try to fill those 90% of cases where we still don't understand the molecular aspects of breast cancer. Another package has arrived at Mark Vidal's office. Hello. Hey. Wow. I have a package for Mark Vidal. Is Mark in? He is. But while you're walking over there, would you please sure. pass that on to him? No problem. Let's see the story with this one. All right, see what he got here. Okay, so... This package has traveled more than 10,000 kilometers. So this is a lady called Nyaloka Oma. Okay. We went from a small town in Kenya all the way to Boston. Uh -huh. Two, three, four, five, six. Six, six, six there you are. Separation. There you are. Perfect. <laughs> from urban myth to maths equation, to a daring new approach to fighting disease. This is the promise of network science, a new way of seeing our world. Six degrees is not just an urban myth after all. A 
decade on, Kevin Bacon has decided he might as well accept his cult status. When I first heard about the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon game, I was really kind of horrified. I thought it was a joke at my expense. And I was hoping that it would go the way of Pet Rocks and 8-track cassette tapes, but it seems to be hanging on. Now he's put the power of social networking to good use, launching a charity website, sixdegrees.org. The site lets people introduce their friends and their friends' friends to good causes, like Mark Vidal's cancer research. If you take me out of the equation, it's really sort of a beautiful notion, the notion that we are all connected in some kind of way. Our packages are passed through 28 countries and 53 cities. Although only three reach Mark Vidal, they average just six steps to get there. Six Degrees has revealed a new view of nature and a reminder that if the world is small, then we're all in this together. Everything appears to be connected in ways that you know, were absolutely not predictable just 10 years ago or even five years ago. It's going to completely change the way we think about the world. Network science is the foundation of the 21st century. All the major problems in science today depend on understanding networks. Probably first steps of a newborn elk are the last of their worries. Secret Forms of Yellowstone is next on BBC Two.